It's kind of you, you caught it's like the hot stuff right now the hot buns in the town but i don't know <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know about that but it, you know amongst guitar players for sure hopefully, yeah, yeah. and hopefully it, it grows um yeah but yeah, where but did it, you come up with i mean obviously the idea came from the lockdown but you know yeah yeah how well, did I mean, it all start I, I was kind of uh teaching this course in the summer so i bought a few things here to you know mics and interface and i didn't have anything at the beginning of this i did everything oh, wow. i would always go to studios uh to record or i would go to friends houses if it was something small that i needed to do overdubs or something like that and you know go to a friend's home studio and do yeah. stuff like that any kind of video i would pay people to do that of course um <clears throat> and but during this time um when zoom kind of like once i downloaded zoom and i used it a couple of times i was like wow there's like some possibilities here and I, I had already had this kind of standards from film course on the back burner. It was like an idea that I was thinking, like, maybe I'm going to develop this into a course. Um, and, uh, you know, that whole thing, I was just making these posts on Instagram about the, the history of some of the most iconic standards. So then after uh, the lockdown happened, I started to uh, do more of them. So I was like, well, I'm, you know, next semester, I'm going to try to do this at a school. So I should have at least like nine or 10 classes. So then I used like April to do, to add four more songs to the, mm. the repertoire of the standards from film. And then in May, I was just like, well, I might as well just do this over the summer because there's no gigs. Yeah. Everything I had had uh, up until September at that point, by the time May came, everything till October was canceled. And so uh, I was like, well, I have to do something to make some money over the summer. So, um, so I just in May just kind of digitized everything and put it uh, in a, you know, first edition kind of like Zoom uh, offering for the summer. And then now it's been upgraded since I took the money that I made from that, of course, paid some bills and <laughs> and um, invested in some more gear. And then once I had the gear to do the class with all the stuff and. Uh, and cameras and and things like that uh i was just like well i might as well just do a live stream <laughs> you know yeah um and you know because i i kind of saw that uh once i started getting gigs that were canceled into 2021 that's when i was like it's going to be two years and yeah. still and, uh, yeah i wouldn't guess that anyone is going to play any major tours until 2022 2023 yeah 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 it's just uh there's too much and maybe some small venues but uh no major festivals no theaters yeah. that that's not probably 2023 probably yeah those, those places book a year in advance or at least six months in advance so yeah in order for them for them to do that they have to be a hundred percent certain that the money is going to come in and they're going to spend it you know so sure. i wouldn't i wouldn't guess any any time in the next year yeah yeah, but that's what you did. Like that's like almost the future or the present, scary wise. But also, I mean, well, yeah. Hopefully, the, the well, it's a little bit of both. Yeah, uh, like the present, in terms of uh, some musicians have this option to still make yeah. uh, some pretty decent, you know, uh, money, and and others it, it might not work so well because they haven't had a chance to tour for over yeah. a decade, which I've done. So, so then they don't have a really a fan base yet. So that would be a little bit more difficult if I was just starting out or even yeah, if this was like, you know, if this was 15 years ago. I mean, yeah, it would have been a, a disaster. <laughs> so, uh, just the fact that I could, you know, do it, work yeah. and, and make some money and invest a lot of money. So instead of doing the next record, I used all of that money for this. Oh for yeah. This, like, uh, and it's still going, you know, like, um, I could easily spend, an, you know, it, sure. a lot more. Um, so it, it's the, the, the budget of doing like a, a major record, you know? Yeah. But to, can you lead to, me to through the process? 
like yeah. uh, uh, what's it, what how do you guys do it actually i mean it's basically like it is like i don't know a guitarist or a piano player comes there you just start jamming or like what what's yeah. the preparation the whole day i mean like on a sunday for you um for sunday like people yeah the guests arrive at 3 30. i mean everything's ready to go like for friday and saturday i kind of get everything set up for whoever's coming over so whether it's piano or guitar guitar is really easy yeah. Uh, piano is a, a lot more involved because I don't have a piano, so it's all done with a with a controller, like a, this Kawai uh, VPC-1, yeah. which is an incredible, I and mean, it feels like you're playing a grand piano. Um, every piano player that's been over here has been like, man, <laughs> this is like, how much is this, <laughs> you know? Um, but the sounds are coming through uh, Keyscape. So I'm, I'm running the piano through Keyscape back out into amplifiers which is weird but it's not weird if you're playing a Rhodes so that's the only thing but it is weird if you're having a grand piano sound so yeah. but the way I have the amps in the room um, they're kind of hearing it from a few different sides so then it feels like they're sort of at a grand piano you know yeah. Uh, but yeah you know it's it's never gonna sound <laughs> like a grand piano but it still sounds better than oh, a it shitty, sounds great yeah definitely sounds better than a shitty upright you know and like my I my whole thing is like I, I don't want it to sound like we're in the studio. You know, I want people to sound like they're literally just on the floor in my living room. Like yeah. it's not, and it, you know, like uh, somebody wrote me yesterday talking about they didn't like the sound of the last live stream. And now I, I just wanted to say like, you probably never been to an actual jazz club. Like I can't <laughs> think of one jazz club that sounds yeah. good. Yeah. They sound like shit. Like that's, that's, you know, you go to Mesro they have an amazing piano, but yeah. the room sounds terrible. Yeah. And if they have a live stream from Mesro, it's going to sound even worse than my live stream. So then, you know, if you go to Smalls, the sound is not great. Yeah. It's, it's actually pretty bad. But it's more about the experience of being in the room yeah. with the musicians, you know. So obviously this guy doesn't get it, you know. So, so I was yeah. just like, you know, block. Therefore, if you don't like the sound, then just don't watch. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, I won't even give you the option. Like, if that's the one thing you had to say, that was your contribution. Sure. I didn't like the sound, then, you know. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you've never been to New York and you've never been yeah. to a job. Yeah. But uh, how do you pick the players, by the way? I mean, I guess, I mean, many people are of Taylor and Aaron well, Parks I mean, and all these guys you play with, but like Mike I started Stern, let's say. Friends. Yeah. Well, Mike Stern is kind of a friend. I mean, we don't hang out in a sense like we don't, we're not, but I've seen Mike so much and we have hung out at his apartment, but it was a little bit like, I was like, man, am I going to be able to get Mike to come from Manhattan to bed -Stuy, you know? And, uh, and it, I called him and he was just like, yeah, man. Wow. <laughs> it's like, how do I get there? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but yeah, Mike was kind of the first one that I called that wasn't like a close friend, you know, that. Yeah has actually been to my place before. Yeah. So, uh, but I started with people that obviously I have some kind of friendship with or, uh, you know, camaraderie, camaraderie with as a guitar player or, you know, piano players I've worked with. So I kind of just started there and then now it's kind of like branching out, like Dave Kakoski is gonna do one of these. I mean, I've played with oh, Dave, oh, so. Dave a few times, but you know, same thing, like we've hung at like Jeff Tane Watts' house and like, you know, we've hung, but you know, he's it's another thing to be like, hey man, do you want to come over in my place <laughs> and like do a yeah, live stream? Sure, sure. And uh, and a lot of people, not a lot of people, but there's been a few people that are just like, no, I don't, <laughs> you know? Really? Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, not everybody's down to like uh, be, you know, they're down to do a gig and take a risk, but not really to do it live stream. That's Interesting. An, wow. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I guess also it's COVID times, you know, so some people just don't want to be, they don't know me well enough to be like, okay, I'm gonna go to your yeah. house and play in your living room and then hang out and talk and, you know, yeah. But still, wow, interesting. But uh, <laughs> are, are you also recording these uh, concerts, streams also like audio and? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, that's close mic. You, you know, we, we're recording it into Logic. So um, like, that's, so all of it is, I have all the sessions, you know. Like to make like even like a future kind of live ones album or whatever or like. Uh, I don't think I'll make an album from it, but it might like be some something snippets. where it's it's like a, a membership kind of thing where there'll be oh, like wow. an archive. Super. Uh, and the, the audio, the the, the close mics audio mic audio is going to be yeah. mixed in and it'll it'll yeah. sound much better, you know. And yeah, a good idea. I mean, 
yeah no, no it is but the, the, i wanted to ask you something like like you know in these talks i, I kind of talk to so many amazing musicians about you know writing music composition and everything and uh like one thing i noticed like is your sound always when you play it's so there like always even on the records and i wanted to ask you how did through the years even the early stuff with jeremy pelt and all that like early 2000s hmm. how did you work on your sound like through the uh, years how do you see it i mean more i mean i, I don't it hasn't changed that much that's the funny thing um like i would say like basically it was more or less there around 2004. yeah but so, how did you get there like like uh i mean obviously like from uh, a lot of experimentation and, and people that I, I i really liked the way that they approached guitar but it, it, it came from a mix of rock players and jazz players and brazilian musicians and mm. um you know uh that plus all the horn players um yeah. and then of course touring and you know you're playing with some band leader and you try something once and they'll turn around and they're like yeah keep doing that you know and you're like okay you <laughs> know and it's a lot of um stuff like that where it's like okay <clears throat> it's a collection of things that maybe i tried once and somebody really liked it or uh could even be some things that people in inspired me to do yeah like myron walden or some you know uh you know where they're kind of like singing to you like what they what they're imagining in their head of, of, of mm. the way that you should play behind the piano player or something and then you kind of do that on that gig so many times and then it just becomes a part of the way that you play and um but also like um, i mean i did gigs with liz wright who was yeah. a, a great great singer so i i was playing a lot of acoustic guitar and the electric stuff i was doing with her also was just like very minimal and, and ambient kind of uh you know colors stuff behind the other guitar yeah. player that was in the band so uh, i got a chance that also really influenced me you know the way that i was approaching stuff so a lot of it is just from playing tons and tons of gigs yeah, different you know? people yeah yeah and, you know and different different styles you know yeah uh, of of more or less this this kind of music improvised music or yeah uh, but, yeah jazz if oh. we call it in wider terms or whatever <laughs> yeah but it, yeah i mean but a lot of a lot of other stuff a lot of playing with guys like robert glasper and um, yeah sure you know, where I'm from Houston, so I mean, there's always that element of R&B and, and stuff. There, there's, yeah. there's a lot of things that are involved with it. That it's not just. I mean, tonally, I don't. I didn't really take much from from the guitar players of the past. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe when I was young, when I was young, I would try to imitate. You know, like I had a hollow body, and you know, I would try to get like a West tone or something like that, or. Um, try to make the guitar sound like Joe Pass or, or, yeah. you know, even Pat Metheny. But then, you know, after moving to New York, it became there was so much stuff going on that I just I just trying other stuff, you know. Yeah, no, it's because it's so heavy nowadays. I think to do that, right? To 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 be original in the sense of the sound and playing. And I think you 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 really did it like already. You know, like those records, like I said, you know. Invisible uh, cinema for me, like with Aaron, that's for me, like already one of those points where you play like a few lines and it's like, yeah. fuck, man, that's Mike Moreno. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the, the <laughs> one of the best compliments I ever got after a gig was uh, uh, this woman came up to me, or she was a young girl at the time, maybe like 22 or 23. And uh, she came up to me after the gig and she was like you know i walked in the room and i didn't know who the band was but when you started playing i was like that's the guitar player from invisible cinema she was like what oh, and she wow. didn't even know she didn't even know my name but that's she was cool. like our you know when, and then when they she, i guess she had looked on her uh, somewhere on her phone uh while in the audience and she was she saw that i played on the record she was like yeah as soon as you started playing i knew that was the guitar player from <laughs> invisible cinema so i mean yeah that record you know, but that was, if you listen to anything that I recorded around that time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Aaron played on my records at that time. Yeah, sure. They're actually, we did my record before Invisible Cinema. So that sound is, is there, you know, like, yeah. it's kind of, um, 
we were playing with Eric Harlan's band. We were playing with my band. We were playing with Liz Wright. We were, you know, a lot of different stuff all mixing together. Yeah. Uh, and we all recorded. There was a bunch of albums recorded 2006 to 2008. You know, that that kind of were developing that, that sound. I like that. Yeah. But you mentioned before, like, rock players. That, like, as a teenager, did you, like, go through, like, I don't know, a metal face as well? Like, I don't know, Megadeth or I mean, whatever? Not, not really as a teenager, but, like, uh, as when, that's how I started playing. So when I was, like, 11, 12, you know, 10, uh, when I first picked up the guitar, it was all, like, you know, rock, metal kind of stuff. Yeah. And then when I was, about, like, 13, I started listening more to, like, some classical guitar and, like... Um, players like Larry Carlton and oh, yeah. uh, you oh, know so. Steely Dan all oh, the yeah. guitar players that were playing with Steely Dan and like uh, so just a little bit more melodic playing like even Van Halen for me was like a, a departure of what I was listening to before that mm. um, so yeah and then I got into like Holsworth and you know, I was kind of segued from rock into jazz through Steely Dan and Alan Holsworth and you checked uh, him out like did you transcribe him as well like his lines no no I mean um he was like an alien really like yeah I mean it I mean I liked it but at the same time I liked other stuff more so mm -hmm. uh, I mean Holsworth was like kind of mind-blowing um but also there, there was something about the f fusion mm. yeah, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. it just doesn't it it is a it, it had I, I believe like it's it's kind of like like metal like eighties metal. It's not at all. It hasn't survived the times unless you're like mm -hmm. a fan from that period. And I feel like kind of a lot of the fusion stuff. Like if you think of all the fusion musicians, yeah. That like by the end of the eighties, they were back to playing acoustic music. It was just it. I don't know if it <laughs> if it uh, really warranted to keep going <laughs> yeah this is sound wise especially i mean it's like it just, yeah. there's this kind of a dated sound and uh um, yeah, yeah yeah so then i i wanted to get that kind of intensity but still with a clean sound more or less sure. you know yeah, yeah. but uh, how was it like for you like regard i mean i've read somewhere like kendrick scott and robert glasper and all these guys you were at the same high school yeah we went to high school together I mean, like, that's uh, insane <laughs> that's like yeah i mean uh, how was that like well, I mean, when it was happening, it was just, we were just a bunch of kids, but, yeah. but it, you know, we were kind of just trying to inspire each other all the time. So, uh, especially me, I was so inspired by like the people who had gone to the school. Mm. Uh, I mean, my first year there, there were still some like seniors that were kind of around luckily and that took me under their wing. And then when they left, I kind of took, I mean, I, it's not like I took people under my wing, but I was... I brought a lot of music that the the other guys just weren't listening to, you know. Mm. So um, I, I had Robert Glasper to a lot of music, um, but he had his thing already. Like it's funny. Like Robert has always sounded more or less the same. Wow. Um, yeah. But of course, it's gotten better, like way better. But he he still sounds to me. He sounded like that when he was fifteen. It's just that kind of the way his personality is in his playing and and it, he just found a way to take that and make it um you know kind of grow into what's happening yeah. now yeah. uh but you know like you know walter smith and kendrick scott there were always like you know i was always bringing records and showing them to them and of course they would bounce off of that and start buying a lot of other stuff you know yeah but um and the sun, and then they were you know of course they would they would might find a record that i didn't know and we were always just checking out music together so um but yeah i was transcribing tons of music and bringing it into that school so um i was like the 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 combo leader so i was in charge of you know putting the sets together and bringing in the music and so i was just at home transcribing stuff for that band to play you know when we were in high school oh wow, uh, beautiful yeah, yeah so it was, it was but it was a fun time um and you know we we knew that eric carlin had gone there and and jason moran and um a few other people uh, uh incredible musicians so like yeah. you know you would see their names on the wall on all these 
awards that they had won. So then it was always just like we were always playing or practicing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Cool. When, when did that like trigger happen for New York? Then I mean, you went to new school, right? Uh, yeah. Me yeah, and yeah. Glasper, uh, me and Robert moved to New York and went, started a new school at the same time. How, how was that experience like for you, like going to New York? I mean, Houston, of oh, course. Man, it was just like letting two dogs out of a cage. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, we went crazy like a first year, just going to see everything, going to every jam session, staying out all night, and like yeah. trying to meet people and. Um, you know, just make connections and play as much as possible, you know? Yeah. No, yeah. But, I mean, like, culturally, I remember when I went to New York the first time, like, I mean, but well, yeah, for me, I mean, it's, maybe it's like even the, different, like, I guess. So. I mean, it, it's like, you know, if you grew up eating Italian food somewhere in the, the middle of nowhere, and then all of a sudden you went to, to Naples <laughs> or something, or like to Bologna, <laughs> oh, yeah. and you had, you went to some, like, amazing restaurant that, no, you know, is in the corner of some you know place down the street you know yeah. it's like it's like oh this is this is what it's really supposed to be you know i mean there were yeah. good musicians in, in texas but uh it was like one here you know like it was never enough to make a full band you know there might be a good saxophone player you know but then you get to new york and it was just like the people on the records were on the street they were in the clubs you were hanging out in they were hanging at smalls they were hanging at the jam sessions they were playing of course at all the clubs so you could pay to see them or you could just go to a jam session and hear them play yeah just uh, just play tunes like at a jam session you know like if they if they wanted to get up and play yeah so yeah it was a whole nother a whole nother level of musicianship all i mean obviously it's like you know most of the people who play this music that are known around the world live in new york so yeah or, or they're so good that they're here all the time you know <laughs> yeah well like, yeah. when you what were like you remember some of the first concerts you saw in new york when you came like that uh, kind of blew your mind mind or yeah we saw um i remember seeing greg tardy's band greg tardy oh. was like a guy uh yeah he was on impulse at the time yeah and uh nicholas payton was in his band and that's when you know nick must have been like 22 or 23 <laughs> So if I was 18, he was 23. Yeah. Uh, so Nick was like 23 and he was already famous. You know, he had already put out like four records yeah. at that time. So, but that was one of them. A lot of them involved Nicholas Payton. He, he never lived in New York, but he's always there. He's always here. Uh, that's what I mean. Like if you can play, yeah. uh, you either live here or you're just here all the time. Uh, I mean, at least, you know, once every two months or something like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. So, um yeah but i saw nick's band also at the village vanguard that was right after that was right before they released that album uh peyton's place so they were, they were playing all of that music and um that was still still to this day one of the most amazing shows i've ever seen but i saw brad meldow i saw brian blade I saw uh you know josh redman elastic band before it was called elastic band and when it was just sammy hell trio uh those guys were playing on Tuesdays at Smalls and also Sam would play with Peter Bernstein and Brian Blade all the time yeah. and uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel was playing on Thursdays uh, I saw that band a few times and um, yeah Bill Frizzell at the Vanguard with like Paul Motion and Joel Levano I mean just tons yeah. of tons of amazing amazing stuff Kenny Garrett would play like the JVC Jazz Festival like out in the park for free you know like Kenny Garrett with Jeff Tane Watts Kenny Kirkland and like Nat Reeves Oh, wow. Well. Uh, there was a lot of cool, like, cool free outdoor stuff, you know, at that yeah. time, too. Yeah. Because there was, like, the JVC Jazz Festival. There was the uh, JNR Festival, which I got to play after we played that festival with, with Aaron Parks right after Invisible Cinema came out. Mm. Uh, so there's some video. I, there used to be videos of that show, like, where we That's did Nexus nice. and, and Peaceful Warrior. But I think somebody, whoever had that account, took it down. Um, but, yeah, uh, there was a JVC... Uh, JNR, Charlie Parker Festival, which still happens. Um, you know, seeing Roy Haynes' band, like there was there was a lot of stuff. Yeah, amazing. And immediately yeah. you you started basically recording also, right? Like, I mean, that Bilara record came out. Well, like... Yeah, that was done during the first semester of New School. Wow. Uh, and that was just like, even though it didn't come out until we had graduated. Oh. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, that was done four years before that record came out. 
uh, at least that one song that one song it was like a track he had done yeah. when we were all 18 and he just kept it he didn't redo it for whatever reason i mean but you, you guys I mean, always stuff cool mates yeah. at the new school or mm. oh, sorry say that again you you were kind of like uh schoolmates at the new school That's yeah cool. yeah it was, when i first started new school uh marcus and marcus strickland ej strickland me and robert um carlos enriquez plays bass for the lincoln yeah. center band was there um wow. That's a nice Justin class. Kaiser, Justin Kaiser, who's Ryan's Ryan Kaiser's brother, also plays trumpet, was there, um, and who we were just talking. And Blau, Blau was yeah, so we had Blau. we had a, and Greg Rob Murray was there too. Really, oh, wow. all the freshman year. So we had a band with Arnie Lawrence. Arnie Lawrence was the guy yeah. who started the new school. Yeah, so Arnie had a band, and it was me, Robert, uh, Gregoire, Blau, and. And then the, rhythm, the the bass and drums is kind of random, but 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 also cool. So Aaron Comus was playing drums, and this guy Renee Hart, who was uh, Arnie Lawrence's son-in-law, so he was playing bass. And uh, so that's the band on that one Bilal tune. It's like me, Robert, Renee Hart, and Aaron Comus, and Bilal, of, co yeah. uh, of course. But we also did a, a record with Arnie that never came out. <laughs> I oh, mean, shit. yeah, I, somewhere I had that recording. It's insane. It's, it's not worth listening to, but um, it, it would just be fun to hear it again, just to laugh at it kind of, because Arnie was such a, like a crazy character, man. Yeah. And he, you know, he, he was like, yeah, you know, once we recorded, he was like, yeah, you know, so, um, you know, this, this song, this album is going to come out. It's going to make millions of dollars, you know, so. <laughs> I'm going to share the money with you guys, you know, <laughs> we're just like, man, okay. I mean, I was 18 and I knew that was bullshit. <laughs> so then, you know, we, we obviously just did that. It was only like four tunes or something like that, but still it was funny. And we did it at Aaron Comus's house. He had a basement studio that was right next to my dorm room, literally like the next building over from the new school dorm where I lived Whoa. was a, just really nice condos and Aaron Comus, that's a drummer from the spin doctors, you know? Yeah. So Aaron, you know, he they had just had their whole decade of success with the Spin Doctors, so he had the money. Uh, he was like the only musician I knew in New York at the time that was rich. <laughs> you know, super nice place. So we he had a studio downstairs, and we would record there. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful, man. And mm -hmm. uh, how how did then the story with Jeremy happen? Felt because he's like Jeremy. Your... Yeah, I met Jeremy at the same time I met like Jalil Shaw and Jonathan Blake. Mm. Who else was in that band? Uh, I met Wayne Escoffrey on that trip. It, we got picked to do this um, Thelonious Monk Institute summer uh, school thing. So it was like two weeks paid uh, workshop. Ooh, so it, and it was part of the, uh, the Monk Institute and they would fly you to Aspen, Colorado. That's Snowmass, actually. Snowmass yeah. is a little bit higher than Aspen. So you flew into Aspen and then you would go to Snowmass and it was two weeks out in the mountains, super beautiful. Um, so I did that. I can't, it was really random how I got that gig. But anyway, uh, not a gig, but, you know, opportunity, I guess you should say. But there, that's where I met Jeremy. I met uh, Jalil Shaw and, and mm -hmm. Jonathan Blake and Wayne Escoffrey. And I, I remember, like, just hanging out with Jeremy and listening to records, you know, like he was like, what are you checking out? What do you, you know, how did you learn to play guitar like that? You know? And, uh, and I was really into Jeremy cause he sounded like Freddie at the time, you know? Uh, and he had a lot of miles stuff, you yeah. know, and was playing a lot of Freddie and those are my two trump favorite trumpet players, you know? So, um, we, of course, as soon as he was like, well, you know, I live in Boston at the moment, but I'm going to be moving to New York. So as soon as he moved to New York, he called me and uh -huh. I still remember we did a session at, the new school and I introduced them to Robert and Marcus and the EJ Strickland. That was mm -hmm. so they all met Jeremy from from that one session. Yeah. And I forgot who was playing bass, but it was probably uh probably Carlos Enriquez, I'm not sure. Yeah. And was it also with Jeremy that you for the first time went to Europe? I mean, how was that experience yeah, like Yeah, uh 2004. So that thing at Snowmass where I met Jeremy was probably was the summer of ninety nine. Mm, wow. In ninety nine. Yeah. Early. Wow. And how was your oh, first no, year? No, no, sorry, no, it was the summer of ninety eight. Wow. So then 
uh, so Jeremy moved to New York somewhere around. I was still at New School because I got a room at New School. So it must have it must have been yeah it was like the next year. So he must have moved to New York in uh, in in ninety nine or two thousand at the latest absolute, but probably ninety nine. So anyway, um, oh. yeah. Uh, how was Europe like for you? For like as a touring musician, I, you know, do you remember your first tour? How, how was that like? I mean, for me, that was like mind blowing <laughs> if I remember. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I remember going to Hamburg. Hamburg was the first gig. And, uh, you know, Jeremy had been to Europe, uh, like a couple of times, I think at that point. And, and Tommy Crane was in the drum, was oh, in the wow. band playing drums. Uh, and Derek Nevergel, Derek was playing with Terrence Blanchard at the time. Mm -hmm. so there was this quartet. So it was me, Derek Nevergel and, uh, Tommy Crane. And I think also Derek had been, uh, to Europe. And so, yeah, it was just, yeah, to <laughs> I mean, you know, like I said, as soon as I got back to the U.S., I've told some people, you know, the first thing I did was go shopping and get some real clothes because, you know, I felt like so out of place, you know, like just what I was wearing at the time. And, you know, it's like no attention to style or anything like that. And um, but, yeah, just everything, you know, dealing with different currency and never, you know, yeah. eating different foods. And, you know, it was all in Germany and Austria and in uh, Denmark. So oh, okay. and, and we went to Switzerland, too. Um, so yeah, just seeing like those kind of places like Switzerland is like, I mean, yeah. amazing, uh, beautiful, like so clean. It's like kind of like an unreal, like clean, yeah. cleanliness of the streets there. Um, but yeah, that was a super fun tour, man. Uh, and yeah, it was all pretty much driving. We drove everywhere. I don't think we flew. Yeah. yeah, we that was yeah i remember going all the border crossings and giving my passport you know change you know switching countries and stuff like that yeah but yeah so yeah it was like i don't know 10 cities or something like that yeah a couple a couple in denmark a bunch like seven and six or seven in germany and then a couple places in switzerland wow that's a lot a couple that's quite, quite a long maybe one it was more than, maybe it was more than it was two weeks wow. so maybe it's more than 10 shows then it's a long one yeah. for the, for, for the yeah, first one. <laughs> and uh, when, when did that moment for you, like, so we're talking like, I don't know, 2000. That was 2004. Four. So when, when April, did that moment? April of 2004. Four. Happened for yeah. you to become a band leader, like when you did Between the Lines. When did you that feel was, like We recorded right... that two years later, uh, almost exactly two years later, like March of 2006, I believe. So how um, was that like for you to to become a you know decide i mean to i would i had already there. been playing with my band in new york so sure. we had already played smalls we had already played the jazz gallery and like a, a few other venues and you know i already had good people in my band the, the music was kind of developing um but i you know i was playing with jeremy's band in 2004 i was playing and then at the end of 2004 i got the gig with liz wright mm -hmm. uh and then in the middle of 2005 like i was playing with liz for about seven i don't know maybe not that long actually i think i only played with liz from uh, like kind of october of 2004 to the end of august 2005 and then the end of august i went right from a tour with liz to enjoying josh redmond's band yeah how did that and, happen yeah I, I wanted to ask you about well, josh or redmond i mean um that's a big one well that was kind of like uh it was a, a a thing and it was like years in the making because i'd actually sort of auditioned for that band without i mean audition meaning they called me to come and play for a session uh, uh. and the, they called they, they said they called another couple of pl guitar players they never told me who it was but they were like yeah you know we you know we'll let you know because we, we you know there's a couple other guys that are coming you know to play with and see how it feels but i remember josh calling me this is 2001 oh wow that's uh, really early it was Sep September September tenth, two thousand one, the day before. Wow, shit! September Seriously? 11th. Yeah. So September tenth, wow. two thousand one, I was like on cloud nine because Josh called me the same day and he was like, "Man, he was like, we listened to a, a couple of guys and um, and we we really love the way you you play the music." And um, he was like, "I'm gonna, you know, I'm getting some things together and I'll let you know what's happening." And then the next fucking day, man, the next morning, yeah. like September eleventh happened. And then I think, uh, you know, obviously it messed up a lot of stuff for a lot of people. And um, 
and it just kind of fell fell through and then four almost four years went by before i really heard from josh again but he kind of sounded me out they called me pretty far in advance to join the band and so i was on the road with liz and i i just asked her you know yeah up front like uh what she thought and she was like well do what you have to do and so then i wrote her manager and i i I actually wanted to stay in the band with Liz because I loved the music we were playing at the time. Yeah. And so I asked them if they could pay me what Josh was going to pay me. And they said, hell no. <laughs> so, so I left, you know. Wow. But how was it like for you to play? Like, I mean, Josh is one, one generation older, right? Like, yeah, I mean, Liz was younger than me. So she yeah. was like two, two years younger than me, maybe. And Josh was about, you know, Josh is about 12 years older than me, maybe. So, um, I mean, for me, it was, it was, um, I mean, that was really the gig I wanted. It's just, I was having such a good time in that band with Liz. With Liz and yeah. I felt like I was getting, getting to something different. Um, but you know, I just kind of brought that to that band, you know, to Josh's band. But yeah. you know, when I probably, I probably, if they had said, we'll pay you, if Liz had said, we'll pay you as much as Josh, I probably still would have taken the Josh gig. Um, I just, it was just a hard choice at the time, but, sure. um, and I tried to work it out to where I could do both, but her management wouldn't let me. So, um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I mean, I've been a fan of Joshua Redman since the beginning. Like yeah. one of the first jazz records I ever bought was wish with Pat Metheny. Pat, yeah. So that yeah. One, that one, yeah. Um, so it was a little bit kind of nerve and also I had seen josh's band that's how i met josh the first time i saw him playing in houston with his band uh with peter bernstein it was the freedom mm. of the groove band oh yeah oh i love that group man. yeah so i met all those guys i met blade that day peter and josh and you know uh, we all exchanged info and stuff like that and kind of you know i called peter a couple of times before moving to new york and uh, so you know and the, really that was the gig i wanted you know it's like yeah. I was like, wow, well, okay, Pat Metheny did this gig, and then Peter Bernstein. That's, um, a, that's a nice line, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, when I joined the band, Josh had just released a new record, and Kurt was on it, Peter Bernstein. Yeah. And uh, Eric, uh, what is the guy's name? He played with, uh, I forget the name of that band. They were kind of big at the time. Oh, Eric Krasnos. Eric Krasnos, yeah, Eric Krasnos. Krasnos, yeah. Yeah. So he, he was on that record, too. Uh, and so I just kind of had to fill in all of those, which was kind of perfect for me. I think that's why they asked me to do the gig because they knew I could kind of yeah. play straight ahead like Peter. I could play some more kind of fusion-y stuff like Kurt and I could um, just, you know, the rhythm stuff was just just funky, like, probably the weakest, it's, thing, yeah. weakest thing for me, but still I was, I could do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. So yeah. I, I think it was this, they were looking for somebody who could kind of, whatever and it that actually in that band it came up to where that was a necessity like where there was a couple of gigs where jo where um greg hutchison while we were on the road he had to he had to leave he had like a family emergency oh, and so he left like he left us at the airport we're about to leave to from italy to ireland and he just picked up the phone and was put it down and he was like guys i gotta go and then he just got on a plane went back to new york Oh. And we were on the road without a band. So then we did two gigs with a pickup drummer on that tour. And uh, we just played standards, you know. So if, oh, <laughs> if, it was somebody, wow. yeah, if, it was, if it was somebody who was a fusion player, it would have been, that would yeah. have been terrible gigs. Yeah. Because, yeah, also the drummer we had was not not fitting the band. <laughs> it was, it was, there were two rough, really rough gigs. But, um, and it would have just been a total disaster otherwise. So, what did you learn, like, from Joshua as being a band leader, like, how, how, like that you kind of transferred to your own leading bands? Um, I mean, with Josh, he was just—I think with most of the band leaders I've worked with, with the exception of maybe someone like Myron Walden, um, they're pretty hands-off. Like, they're unless something is really wrong, like they pretty much trust that you're going to learn the music and mm. and. Uh, and play the gig so yeah. with josh it was just always kind of surprising how how it wasn't nerve-wracking you know like a like it didn't feel it didn't feel like i was playing with 
one of the biggest names in in the jazz world other than the types of gigs we were doing but i mean everything backstage all the conversations anytime we were just playing the music it just worked so it wasn't you know there was never a moment this one moment i remember in japan where he came backstage and he was like man you can't you can't both be playing at the same time like to me and to me and uh sammy hell but that was like one time out of like six months of touring you know yeah and that never happened again, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, you know, he, you could tell, like, I mean, in order for him to say something, he must have, it must have been going on for maybe a night or, or, or a couple of couple of songs or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there was stuff where, like, me and Sam were kind of comping together, and it was too much. Or, yeah. <laughs> are, are but you... other than that, I mean, it was always just like, man, let's just play. I mean, you know, you know the music. Yeah, you fit, you fit the vibe. We, you know, they had chose me for a reason. You know, definitely. Are yeah. are you the same as a band leader in this case? Like, if yeah, you I mean, see yourself as a band leader. If I call someone, that means that I trust one that they're going to learn the music. Yeah. Um, and two that I don't really have to. I call people that I really have to tell them what to do all the time. You know. Yeah, that's um, really important. Yeah. You know, and then. So, I mean, of course, I have suggestions. It's the first time we're going to play something, and um, I might explain the groove, and if it's not the right one right off the bat, I might stop and, and, and say something. But it's usually just with the drums. Because hmm. the drums is a very specific thing. You know, like the piano players that play with me, they all kind of know how to voice yeah. a certain way to make the song so sound the way I want them to sound. But... Um, but drums, it's it's tricky. I mean, they might have a completely different idea of what the song should sound like, but you know, a lot of times it doesn't necessarily fit, uh, or it sounds like it's too much. You know. Mm. But there's one song called Lotus, Bl Blind Imagination. You guys did do. Uh, Whose idea was oh, that Blind for Imagine. the for the groove? I mean, because it's like it's oh, incredible. I, um, I'm trying to remember how we came up with that, but. Uh, I know we did that. I think I, I told Eric to just make it as broken as possible. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because it's, yeah. it's so cool. I love that one. Yeah. I was just like, I, I don't... This song is so simple that it's going to be really boring if we just play it as the groove tune. And um, and actually, we tracked it with bass, but I just took it out. <laughs> oh, seriously? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's and cool. Which Doug, Doug wasn't super happy about, but like... I was like, man, sorry, like, but it just, it sounds so cool without bass. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, it, it was, or it, it needed like key bass or like electric bass. Like so that's the thing, it was like, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so then cool. and there was no way to, you know, I wasn't going to ask him to come in and, and overdub on an electric bass or, at that point, you know. It was just, yeah. I think, I think what will happen is, uh, yeah, I, I me and Aaron Parks were working on some tunes on another day after we had recorded everything. And we changed a couple of things on that tune, just the way that Aaron was comping, I think, or, and, um, and then we were just like, let's take the bass out. <laughs> and then we were like, yeah, that sounds, that's the shit, you know? Yeah. So, so much space suddenly you, you mentioned Aaron and, uh, I, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you about your connection with piano, which is kind of, uh, you know, not, you know, guitar and piano, sometimes guitarists very rarely, I mean, r not rarely, but many guitarists kind of avoid piano nowadays, or even in the past, like you seem to love piano. I mean, you have incredible piano players. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily love guitar music. <laughs> <laughs> so I love, I love when the guitar and piano kind of start to sound like one instrument, you know, yeah. that I like. Where it just sounds like some kind of weird, you know, Asian or instrument or like some kind of weird electric keyboard or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in general, I you know I'm not I'm not a huge fan of playing guitar quartet you know without without piano. Um, I mean, of course, it's fun to do it, but documenting it for me, yeah. um, I like to do it live. But it's something about recordings uh of just guitar <laughs> I, I don't know i'm just, it's it's too much for me or something yeah no, like, interesting. It, it took me forever to do a trio record and, yeah um, yeah and I, but i love playing trio live but to do a record was kind of like 
you know, it took me a while before I, I could convince myself to do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, what's your process when writing the, the music, let's say for, for Lotus that you did, like, you know, uh, when, uh, I mean, what's your like process? I mean, like compositionally usually. It's just, you know, I never have an agenda when I'm writing, so it's just basically whatever. I mean, I write a lot of different starting points and then whichever ones kind of are inspiring to me, I, I continue that. But yeah, um, nothing. It's it's usually just searching, you know. Yeah. Nothing like strategic. No, no, no. But I mean, do, do like like on a daily basis, like when you practice guitar, like write down. down no, like no. Just sometimes or... I'll, I'll, I, I usually put decide like i'm gonna sit down oh, okay. this, amount, this month or something like i'm gonna try every day to write something you know yeah yeah that's yeah. good that's good cool uh, i also wanted to ask you this like you've done so much work as a collaborator more mm -hmm. even more than a, as a band leader and uh i wanted to ask you like i know about kendrick because you guys come from both from texas but uh yeah like, where did your connection with John Ellis begin? I mean, you've done so much work also together, and I love what you what you do. Uh, well, I mean, John, I know from, um, well, he was one of the first people I played with when I came to New York. Hmm. Uh, but we had met maybe a month before moving to New York. Uh, I met him in New Orleans. I went with a friend to, to see John's uh, record release party. We drove from Houston. My friend called me. He was like, hey, man, I'm going to New Orleans tomorrow to see... Wow. Uh, this guy John Ellis that I just met you know he's he's killing you gotta hear him he was like you wanna go with me I'm gonna drive to see his uh, CD release show in New Orleans I was like yeah why not <laughs> so you know it's like New Orleans from Houston is uh, like five and a half hours six hours wow, most. Jesus. Okay. so then we went there and then we you know crashed in New Orleans for that night drove back the next day and so that's how where I met J uh, Jason Marsalis for the first time mm -hmm. and Roland Garen and uh Actually, Aaron Goldberg was not on that gig. There was another piano player. And, uh, but I met John. <clears throat> and uh, so then he was like, oh, man, you're going to new school. I'm going to new school. So then when oh, I was like, awesome. we exchanged info. And so when I moved to New York, I saw him just at the school. So we were just like, man, let's hang. And uh, I remember like going to get something to eat and talking. And then, you know, he, then next thing you know, he was like, hey, man, I got a gig. Do you want, can you do this? And then and he had another gig. And, yeah. you know, so, yeah. So that's kind of how, and then of course when I made for my band, like he was the first call. Yeah, for that. sure, definitely. Yeah, and the, 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 another one kind of which is not even considering who you played with uh, is like Q-Tip. I wanted to ask you about that. Oh, right. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Tribe Called Quest, seriously. And yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I mean, that's actually was a was a that was like a Kurt Rosenwinkel hookup. Uh, so oh, Kurt was seriously. Kurt was recording with Q-Tip. Oh yeah, that uh, Kamali abstract, right? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had just done that, and then uh, so that's and then Kurt, you know, got married at, at that time, and he moved to Switzerland, and so when he moved to Switzerland, uh, he told Kamal about me. So then uh, I get a call out of the blue and say, like, "Hey man, this is, you know, uh, Kamal, you know, Q-tip." I was like, yeah. "He was like." Kurt gave me your number. We've been recording together. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, I was like, okay. And of course, I knew who Q-Tip was at the time. I mean, he had just recorded like, uh, you know, two, like two years before that was, um, you know, uh, that famous record with Breathe and Stop and like uh, a yeah. uh, vibrant thing and everything. So those songs were constantly on the radio. They were constantly on, on TV. So I had seen the videos and everything. And um, so when he called, I was like, oh, shit, you know, and he was like, so um, he was like, are you, do you have any gigs this coming week? And I, and I said, uh, I was like, yeah, I got I'm playing at the jazz gallery this weekend uh, or next weekend. I think he called like on a, on a Saturday. I was like, yeah, I'm playing the jazz gallery next Friday. I was, and he was like, oh, is there anything before that? I was like, uh, I was like. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm playing at this place called the Blue Water Grill. It was with Peter Mazza, you know that dude? And yeah. uh, it was like a Peter Mazza and uh, Matt Penman. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Two, two guitars and bass. It was like a brunch gig. Like, you know, nobody goes there to hear the music. I mean, Standards. You know? and, so, yeah. yeah, it was like a, a, a good 
paying at the time, you yeah, know, sure. brunch, brunch gig, you know, for a Sunday afternoon. And that, that's at the time where across the street was, was uh, the coffee shop that had Brazilian music. And that was really the scene. So we would take a break and then go watch the Brazilian music um, because it was like the Duke of Fonseca and like, a, oh. um, uh, yeah, it was killing musicians over there. And so, but anyway, so Q-Tip was like, cool, I'll be there tomorrow. And then he just like hung up the phone. <laughs> so he came, he came to the Blue Water Grill and sat at the, at the bar that was right next to, like, we were just playing, like, there wasn't even a stage. It's like, we just sat up next to the bar. And he sat at the bar and he ate, and, like, ate, I don't know, like oysters or something. I can't remember what he had. And then he just had his, like, long black coat, you know. And, uh, and then after he came up, and he was like, man, it's like, yeah, man, sound, sound great. He was like, uh, come to my house on this day. <laughs> so I was like, all right. Well, but it was just, man, it was like the, the least hip place he could have saw me play. You know, it's like. <laughs> that's such a cool one. But oh, after that, cool. we recorded a bunch of stuff. I mean, he recorded a lot of, uh, a couple of my tunes also. But then one of them, he played me like a snippet of what he did with it. And it was killing. Oh, wow. And I was like, man, and then he just pushed stop. He was like, yeah, he's like, I'm still working on it. I was like, man, put this shit out. And, oh, uh, he never, he never did. But it was like this thing that I had. It was like a kind of like a reharm of giant steps. Oh, but wow. he, he heard me playing it. I was he, he had this one guitar at his house and I picked it up and I started playing this thing. And he just came from the other room. He was like, what is that? And then I, I kept playing it. And then he was like, take this bar. I like just play loop the first eight bars. And I did that. And so he used that and came up with this track and he and he just played me like literally like probably five seconds of it and it sounded incredible. And I was so pissed that he never <laughs> he never released it. Uh, but yeah, we did some other stuff like that came, you know, one of them is on uh, the Renaissance record. Yeah. And then I think he used something else for like commercials and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to, to work with such creative people. Mm -hmm. I like it. Cool. I, we, I was... only did, we only did one gig, but I played with him in San Francisco. When I you was actually so did a gig together? Wow. Yeah, we did a gig in San Francisco for Sony, I think. Wow. Uh, and I, I was like, I was really sick, man. I was like fever, like barely able to stand up. And I got through that gig. But yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, incredible, man. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so much stuff you've done. It's it's. Uh, but I will not take more, more of your time, Mike, so that you can... Uh, do other stuff so th yeah, thanks for sharing right. at least some stories i mean yeah definitely man so uh, <laughs> thank cool. you so much dr jazz <laughs> Jazz.